For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Zechariah prophesied about his son John the Baptist, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with an angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Now we light the shepherd's candle in the third Sunday of Advent to remember Christ is our Prince of Peace. May God give you his peace this season. of peace on this third Sunday in Advent. We were drawn to a hymn selection that it turns out is more familiar to some than others. It was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was considered by many to be America's greatest poet. As a child, Longfellow was very intelligent. At the age of three, he was already going to school. And by the age of six, he was reading classical literature. After completing his education, Longfellow quickly rose to the top in the halls of academia after accepting a position at Harvard. Life was good for Longfellow, but then tragedy struck. Longfellow's first wife became suddenly ill and died. Seven years later, he remarried, and he and his second wife had five children. Again, Life was going well for Longfellow until tragedy struck once more. His second wife, while lighting a match, set her clothes on fire, and she died as well. Then, before he could get his life together, America was hit with the Civil War. Longfellow hated the Civil War. He pleaded with God to end it. When Longfellow's own son was wounded in battle and was sent home to recover, Longfellow's prayer turned to rage. As he tended his son's injuries and saw other wounded boys on the streets of Cambridge, he asked his friends, where is the peace? He took pen and paper and began trying to answer that question when he heard the sound of church bells. As he began to write, his poem was filled with gloom and despair. 
the poem would have been completely void of peace and hope had it not been for the last two verses. In those verses, Longfellow wrote, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Which are the last words of the famous Christmas carol, I Heard the Bells, on Christmas Day. We do not have to look too far around us today to see evidence of the tension between the peace we long for and the war and violence that surrounds us. The peace we long for and the conflicts between us. The peace we long for and the restlessness within us. This Advent season, let us open our hearts to the promise of peace, and even now, as we continue with our offertory hymn. Please be seated. This time of year, we sing about the, the Christmas story, a beautiful baby, Christmas cards. It just seems so peaceful. Before us are the emblems, remembering an event that is anything but peaceful, a horrific scene of crucifixion. How could those themes come together? Jesus came. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. And as he became flesh, it was so that he might die for us and become our Savior, our substitute. And so, how fitting at Christmas time that we remember the death of Jesus. And so Jen Horst comes to talk now about the peace of God. So after the first service, I've decided there's a few changes we should have and that we should have little people singing up here a little bit more often because the faith of a child is like nothing else. And the other thing is we should sing in Spanish more often. Um, I wouldn't understand a word, but it sounds amazing. Isaiah 9, 6 says, for, us to child, for, us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This verse was a promise of, was, of what was to come, but now here we are on the other side of this verse. The table today is an open invitation to everyone to reset by remembering the power of the incarnation and the cross, the word became flesh, a child was born, the Prince of Peace. When we think about the birth of Christ in terms of the fullness and the mystery of the incarnation, our understanding of Christmas should change. It's no longer a remote event. It's actually near to us, drawing us in and making us a part of it. I don't know where you are today. Most days, I don't know where I am. But I do know this, I want peace. I especially want the youth of today to experience peace and know that regardless of their circumstance, peace can abound. I think everyone here desires peace. We want war and sickness and disease, poverty and chaos, simply to cease to exist. The indigenous people with whom we share this land today just want peace. Peace would mean that we would have love in the world and it would flourish and there would be no room for hate. And isn't it ironic that we all desire peace, but we struggle to get it and when we do, we can't maintain it. After grappling with feelings of inadequacy, unrest, and a little bit of heartache this week, I reflected on what the Prince of Peace means to me today, right now. How do I allow his character of peace to affect my life? And I want to share with you three things that the Prince of Peace provides for me today. First, the Prince of Peace protects me from myself. Yes, it protects me from myself, my false self that likes to rise up against all that Christ has for me, all that he wants me to be and all that he wants me to become. When I allow the Prince of Peace to speak into my life, peace naturally abounds, and then there's no room left for chaos, disorder, shame, or blame. I have no wiggle room to talk myself out of the fact that I am made in the image of God 
and I was worth dying for. Peace is here and now, regardless of the circumstances around me. It's not the absence of trouble, it's the presence of Christ. I can be in the worst place and still know peace because God is in control. Secondly, the Prince of Peace sustains me. The peace God offers is here and now. It's like an infinite account of which I make withdrawals from. I just need to remember that I'm the person responsible for making those withdrawals. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. This peace sustains me, but there are times that I need to declare things that I don't see. I don't see why God allows certain hardships in my life, but I can declare peace. I don't see peace, but I can choose to declare it anyways. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I think it's one of the most powerful verses. And the peace of God will transcend all understanding. It won't make sense all the time, but it will guard our heart and our minds in Christ Jesus. I acknowledge the, the suffering and the pain and the sadness and discomfort that this time of year can bring to so many. And I say this to acknowledge it, but not to minimize it in any way. It's real and it's painful, and the Prince of Peace will meet you there. That's a promise. Lastly, the Prince of Peace transforms me, and this is the biggest one. Understanding that I am worthy of dying for humbles me in a way that nothing else can. It transforms me each and every day, regardless of how I feel, because it's not a feeling, it's a fact. God is the Prince of Peace. This transformation results not from what I do, but what God has done for me and will continue to do. He came into this world as a baby boy. He came to be what we are, weak, vulnerable, human, limited by time and space, and he chose to live among us. He showed us what the Father is like using words and deeds. He came to bring salvation for all of humanity. And this understanding seeps into everything I choose to do and everything I choose not to do. A few years ago, I had a college teacher write a, co a comment on one of my papers I submitted. He said something along the nature of I didn't do what he had asked to do. The purpose of the paper was to connect with God through a chosen parable. And the paper was supposed to be a reflection of that interaction. I thought it was kind of rude of my teacher to assume that I didn't have this interaction. After all, he didn't know who I was. He was the teacher on the other side of the computer. But as good teachers do, he read between the lines. And looking back, I can see that I was probably, in fact, more concerned with submitting the paper than allowing the creator to touch my heart. If we do not allow the creator to enter into the most sacred parts of our heart, he can't place the peace where we desire it to be. He needs my heart to impart the peace that passes all understanding. That is the fine art of transformation. Peaceful is not how you would describe snippets of my life. My circle of influence as a classroom teacher and guidance counselor at a high school is choked with mental health issues, family disorder, self-harm, misunderstanding, cultural hatred, disharmony, high pressure to succeed, suicide, gender confusion, self-hatred, and the list unfortunately goes on. But my history and my students' history does not dictate where we will go. The Prince of Peace will continue to use my history as well as theirs to transform us in ways that only he can. So today is a great day to start peace anew, to partake in the peace that only the Prince of Peace can give. As a song perfectly puts it, Chris Koenig sang it a few weeks ago, come to the table to remind yourself of where grace begins. Take your place beside the Savior and be set free. It doesn't mean that you don't have any questions. I would actually fear for you if you don't, because that would mean the learning and transformation has stopped. The table today is a place of freedom to accept Jesus' death on the cross for you, but to openly have questions about what that means for the rest of your life. So you see, it's never done in perfection. We're all just a motley crew of broken people. And despite knowing your secrets, God still loves you.
He's the only one who, when storms arise, presses on and comforts you in his everlasting arms. God's focus is on you all the time. And he wants to give you peace in all circumstances. Make room in the inn for Christ today. So to those of you who are fear-driven or full of faith, shaken or steadfast, distracted or devoted, full of despair or hope, this bread is for you. Take the time in this moment to make that personal connection between the Prince of Peace and your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you for, to give us increasing view of how much you actually love us. Thank you for the incarnation and the cross as a symbol of the security of your love. This is the bread, and we take it in remembrance of you. Amen. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The God of peace will be with you. Reading together. Blessed, Blessed are, are the peacemakers, peacemakers for they will be called children of God. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Live in harmony with one another. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you know that your brother or sister has anything against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled with your brother or your sister, and then come and offer your gift. The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Jesus came to bring peace. He tells people over and over not to be afraid. Repentance and reconciliation can bring peace, peace with God and with one another. Ridding ourselves of the burden guilt places on us and making things right, where possible with the people around us, will open us more to the experience of the manger, the glory of Christmas, and the King who awaits us as a little baby. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said that those who make peace shall be called the children of God. When Christ, the Prince of Peace, comes to us, he brings us peace, and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. Prince of Peace, reveal yourself to us afresh today. We need peace in our lives, our homes, our families, our church, and our whole world. Help us to slow down and seek out the peace you provide and to be forgiving so that we may become peacemakers for ourselves and others. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. In your name, Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jen, for talking about that peace that is in our hearts, that's in our lives, that we receive from God. I was asked this week to talk about peace when it comes to the cup. And I paused this week and I was thinking it through and I realized that really the cup is all about forgiveness. It's really about Jesus' death on the cross and how you know, his death means we have forgiveness. And how incredible that is. And as I was thinking through forgiveness, it, it was such a, an incredible connection 
Because in forgiveness, there is peace. See, unforgiveness represents a war. Unforgiveness represents a battle. But because God has forgiven us, we receive that peace. And because we receive that peace, we also extend that peace. Galatians 5 uh, talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and and in there, uh, one of them is peace. See, peace is not meant for us to hold on to. Peace is not meant for us to capture and, and hold close to ourselves. Peace is meant to flow, to move in us and through us as we walk through this world. As I looked at scripture this week, uh, I, I looked at all kinds of different things, and there was an, it's amazing when you search uh, peace and you start reading through and seeing how God has weaved that all through his word. And so I wanted to pause and just walk through uh, a few verses that I think are incredible that really point us, not peace internal, but peace external. What does it mean to allow peace to flow through us? I want to start in Psalms 34, verse 14. It says this, Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. In this verse, it stands to reckon the action is to do good. Peace is rooted in goodness. Peace is rooted in doing something for someone else that is based in goodness. It's incredible when people receive peace, how they're led to that moment of thinking, wow, that was awesome. That was great. That was good. And we pursue this thing. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Our action is to make sure that peace is rooted in goodness and that we pursue it. Romans 12, 18 says this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. See, peace extended depends on you. We could hold peace. We could try and capture it and keep it for ourselves. But that is not the Christian way. The Christian way is to walk this earth, to live amongst your friends, and to extend peace. These things that God gives us. What does it look like in your workplace? What does it look like in your home, in your friendships? It depends on you to allow that to flow. James 3, 18 says this. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness... So in peace. It's an action. Peace isn't simply something that just happens, but peace, when it flows, is an action. It's something that says, you know what, I want to physically, I want to, with my words, make a difference. I want to bring peace to the places in my life, in my world, where there is little peace. Standing around the water cooler as people talk about the person on the other side of the office. For me, school mornings, trying to get four kids out the door. I think at Christmas time, as relatives get together and we have much history together, some very good, some very tough. Lastly, in Colossians chapter three, verse 15, is this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as a member of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. I love this because I think as a follower of Jesus Christ, as I walk around the world that I'm in, it's an easy way for me to extend peace is to be thankful. To be thankful for those things that that maybe people have done on my behalf. To be thankful for the things that are given to me. See, when Christ forgave me, that inspires me to be thankful for the forgiveness that he's extended to me. 
There's something peaceful about that. There's something that happens. It de-escalates environments that are full of challenge. See, the world is full of hate. We can find that fairly easy. Discord and fighting, frustration, upset, worry. These are the things that you don't have to travel very far. I mean, just read the news. I also think we don't have to look very far in our community of Elmira with 10,000 plus people. These things are evident here. See, we are the church. Jesus left. He died on the cross and he was resurrected on the third day. And he walked this earth for a time and then he left again. But he gave us the Holy Spirit. And I love it because we are the representation of Jesus Christ in this world. We carry the Holy Spirit in us. And as we move through this world, God calls us to be people of peace. Jesus is our ultimate example. It reminds me of the words that Jesus uh, says, and, and Luke captures these words in Luke 23, 34. There's this moment when he's on the cross, he's hanging on the cross, and he's suffered in incredible ways, and in that moment, he looks upon the people that are there, and he could call down heaven. He could call down legions of angels to have justice, to make his point, to show them that he is the king. And what does he choose? He chooses these words. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Those were his words. Most of us will never find ourselves hanging on a cross. But we will find ourselves in moments where we need to extend words of peace. We need to extend actions of peace. This morning, as you look at the cup, I want you to pause. I want you to just consider his forgiveness for me. Not only does it change my heart and my life, not only does it bring peace to me, but how do I move from a stance of fight, a stance of closed fistedness, into a, a stance of openness to extend the peace that God has given me? Would you bow your heads with me as we pray for the cup? God, we thank you so much. that your son followed through on your plan, Lord God, to hang on that cross, Lord, so that our sins could be forgiven, God, that we could stand before you today and declare you as Lord and to ask forgiveness. And God, as we receive that today, I ask, Lord, that you would not only allow peace to happen within our own hearts, but God, that you would allow peace to flow from us to our neighbors, our colleagues, our families, our extended families, those that we deeply love, and those maybe that we dislike. God, we give you praise. Thank you for your son on the cross. In churches throughout the world today and on every Sunday, Men and women stand and pass the peace. They give the peace of Christ that they have to someone else who may have it but not necessarily sense it and feel it. We have the privilege of doing that today. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and greet each other, not with a, hey, how you doing, but, but an intentional, the peace, can stand together. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you and pass the peace of Christ that passes understanding and encourage each other this morning.